the last part of chapter seven is animated by the question that I've written here on the screen. It's a dynamic question. It's a question of the passage of time. Suppose you had an IOU, sometimes written with the three letters I O U, which said, I promise you a dollar a year from now. Suppose you write that down on a sheet of paper and you try to sell it. What would people be willing to pay you for it? What people are willing to pay you for it is called the present value of this IOU. That means the value today. So what is the value today of a sheet of paper with the words IOU a dollar a year from now written on it? What I want to claim is that for several reasons which we're going to enumerate, this value is going to be less than one dollar. In other words, people are usually, some exceptions we'll talk about, but people usually will be willing to pay you less than a dollar in return for obtaining a promise from you to pay them a dollar a year from now. Now let's go through the reasons why people would usually be willing to pay you less than a dollar in order, in exchange for your promise to pay them a dollar a year from now. One reason is you might go bankrupt in the next year and be unable to pay them back. The second is you might die in the next year. So there's another reason why you'd be unable to pay them back. Third, you might be unwilling to pay them back. And even if, there's, if the person thinks there's only a very small chance that you might be unwilling to pay them back, they're still probably going to demand more than a dollar in exchange for this IOU. Um, because, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, less, less than a dollar. They're, they're going to be willing to pay less than a dollar for this IOU. Um, in order to, uh, let's say, not make them feel quite so bad if you happen to be unwilling to to pay them back. And of course, it depends on how much they think you're unwilling and how easy it would be to, for them to, let's say, appeal to the court system to force you to pay them back. Another reason why this is likely to be valued less than a dollar is inflation. Money a year from now is likely worth less than money today, a, a dollar a year from now isn't, isn't, isn't going to buy as much stuff as a dollar can today, so you wouldn't want to give up a dollar today in order to get a dollar a year from now. And the fifth reason is impatience. Uh, most people would prefer money now rather than money later. They've got the dollar right now. If you're asking them to give up the dollar right now in order to or they have the money right now. If you're asking them to give up money right now in order to get a dollar in the future, uh, they're not going to be willing to give up a whole dollar. Maybe they'd be willing to give up you know, 95 cents or 75 cents, but not a whole dollar because if you, because the money that they're giving up right now, they could use to spend money right now and get stuff right now. Whereas if all they have is this IOU, then they're going to have to wait a year before they get stuff. And most people want stuff now rather than a year from now. And so there's this impatience reason why they're not willing to pay you uh, a, a, as, as much as a full dollar. The final reason is alternatives. If 
90 cents deposited in a bank or credit union is going to turn into a dollar next year because of the interest rate that the bank or credit union pays you, then so 90 cents in a credit union, 90 cents today given to a credit union will give you a dollar next year. Then you wouldn't want to pay more than 90 cents for this IOU because uh, let's say uh, it wouldn't make sense to pay 95 cents for this IOU because you'd be paying 95 cents to get a dollar next year whereas in a bank you just get the 90 cents now and they'd pay you a dollar next year so the competing alternatives set a maximum limit on how much you'd be willing to pay for this IOU now there are some deeper questions about this and and then the the, the theory can be controversial. Where where do these alternatives come from? Why is the bank able to pay you a positive rate of interest? Although, frankly, here in early 2021, most banks pay you zero. But but, but often banks have paid positive amounts. And uh, and and where does this come from? Why is it that the economy can generate positive rates of interest? Um, I I think it. I think it has something to do with the the fact that um, that many firms require credit, and and they can use credit in very productive and profitable ways. But we're not going to get into in this class where where does the ability to pay interest on the part of debtors come from. What we are concerned about is the fact that this devalues dollars and costs in the future compared to today so let's talk a little bit about about how it uh, about how it devalues it um, present value is abbreviated PV so what we've seen here is that the present value of a dollar in one year that means one year from now is less than one Traditionally, we've expressed the present value of a dollar in one year in this mathematical form. 1 divided by 1 plus r, where r is a positive number. And you see that as long as r is positive, then 1 plus r is greater than 1. So 1 divided by 1 plus r, which is the whole right-hand side, is less than 1, which, of course, is what we want, because we want it to be less than 1. R goes by a few names. R is called a rate of interest, or interest rate. It's also called a discount rate. Now, we have to be careful about the word discount. You guys are used to going into a store and seeing a sign that you get a 10% discount on apples today. Okay, that's not what this discount means. We're not talking about a price. The discount rate is the same thing as the interest rate. We talk about discounting. In fact, that's the that's the uh, title of this slide here, right? Discounting. Discounting is the process of assigning present values to future cash flows. So, saying that I'm only going to pay you 95 cents for a dollar promised a year from now is discounting that dollar back to the present. If you have a high interest rate or a high discount rate that makes the denominator bigger, which makes the whole thing smaller, which means you're discounting the future dollar even more. So the higher the interest rate or the higher the discount rate, the less valuable future money is. Now, in environmental economics terms, this gets reflected in the following way. There are many, many environmental problems that have the following structure. So many, not all, but many environmental problems have the following structure. If you fix them,
you have costs today and benefits in the future. Think about climate change. If we take action to stop climate change, we're going to have mostly costs today and the benefits accrue in the future. Take um, alleviating species extinction. We have costs today because we've got to stop engaging in those economic activities which endanger the species. And we have benefits in the future because future generations, all future generations get a chance to enjoy a world in which those species exist. So it's, it's I mean, you get some benefits today and perhaps some costs in the future, but it's mostly costs today and mostly benefits in the future. Think about conserving exhaustible resources like copper. Well, you if you conserve exhaustible resources for the future, then you have less exhaustible resources today. So again, you have costs today. And the benefits come in the future because future generations now have more copper available to them. So many environmental problems have this structure of costs today and benefits in the future. If you want to value this fix, this policy that says we're going to fix things, then abstractly the value of the fix is the costs of today which are going to enter in negatively plus the benefits in the future divided by 1 plus r. Now we say 1 plus r, I was my my example was the present value of a dollar one year from now. If you if the benefits flow five years from now, ten years from now, ten decades from now, that uh, you can express that in two ways. You can express it as just increasing r, or a more mathematically general way of expressing it is you have the benefits divided by 1 plus r raised to the n, where n is the year in which it occurs. And then if there are many years in which the benefits occur, then you have many terms like this with slightly different n's. So the benefits 100 years from now divided by 1 plus r to the 100, plus the benefits in year 101 divided by 1 plus r raised to the 101 power, plus the benefits in year 102 divided by 1 plus r raised to the 102 power, where there R is like I had in the other in the other parts of this in this video the annual interest rate, and you have many terms of this type. But let me just keep it simple and suppose that that you have this kind of formula where it need be you're adjusting the value of R to take into account that these things occur far into the future. So let's look at what happens into this formula here when you increase r. So when you increase r, the denominator gets bigger. And therefore, the fraction gets smaller. Now, the fraction represents the positive results of fixing the environmental problem. But the positive approach is the whole fraction. And so if r goes up, the denominator is getting bigger, and so the whole thing is getting smaller. But r going up doesn't change the first term, because the first term doesn't involve an r, because it doesn't involve r, because it's the costs today. And so what you end up getting with an increase in R is that the positive term representing the benefits of the environmental fix becomes less important. The negative term representing the costs of the environmental fix stays the same. And so the value of the fix goes down. In other words, in many, many situations, what we've got is an increase in R 
is bad for the environment because it diminishes the value of environmental fixes. It might cause the value of environmental fixes to go from a positive number to a negative number. In other words, what society cares about is this whole thing, the value of the fix. And it's teeter-tottering between negative and positive, depending on how big the costs are, how big the benefits are, and how big the interest rate is. And the point is that the in uh, rising interest rate can tip the balance the rising interest rate by making the positive terms smaller can tip the whole balance of the whole thing to be negative rather than positive. And that's why decrease increases in the interest rate are in general bad for the environment. Now, this isn't always the case. It is always the case in simple problems which have this structure, cost today and benefits in the future. But not all environmental problems are that simple take extractive resources. Is it really true that an increase in the interest rate is going to be bad for future generations because it's going to encourage us to, to mine more copper now? Well, the thing is, the increase in the interest rate is also going to make it more expensive for copper mining companies to borrow money. And what they, the reason they borrow money is to buy machines to help them mine copper. So an increase in the interest rate it might make it more expensive to borrow money. So they're going to borrow less money, so they're going to be able to afford to buy less machines, so they actually might not be pulling more copper out of the ground. And maybe they will, maybe they won't. You have basically an inner temporal effect, which is the one that this video has been about, where increases in the interest rate are bad for the environment. But you also have this other effect, a kind of capital market credit effect, where increases in R make it more expensive to borrow money, so the firm might not be able to afford as much machinery, so it might not be able to mine as much copper right now. So in more complicated settings, which I have done some research on, the simple story doesn't work. But the simple story works in, frankly, the simple story works in most settings. Now the final question we want to address is, is it morally and ethically appropriate to discount the future? To say that benefits that occur to future generations are, are going to be discounted, aren't going to count as much as benefits that accrue to us? This is the moral ethical question. Now, the very first economist who studied this, um, his name was Frank Ramsey. He studied this in the 1920s. He, a really remarkable guy. He um, he died when he was really young. I think maybe even before the age of 30. But he he made contributions that that we're still talking about. He's British, and um, so Ramsey was one of the first people to to think about the present versus the future in these sorts of terms. And he thought that it was uh, <coughs> a moral weakness to discount the future. He thought it was unethical to discount the future. He said that the people living in the future are going to feel pleasure and pain in exactly the same way as, as, as we do today. And so you should set the discount rate R equal to zero. And so benefits in the future count exactly the same as costs today. And um, I think he, he, he called the advocacy of a positive discount rate a failure of the imagination. That is, a failure to imagine how you yourself are going to feel in the future, so that because so this is an attack on being impatient, or a failure to imagine how future generations are going to feel. And um, so there there are economists who who agree with Frank Ramsey today and, and, and think that the discount rate ought to be zero. Um, most economists, especially in the U.S., uh, don't agree, and they think that the discount rate should be something like the the market interest rate that you see in the bond market. But fundamentally, these aren't questions of, sort of economic efficiency or anything like that. These are ethical and moral questions. And I don't think that economists have any particular expertise in answering those questions. Philosophers probably um, have, a, 
have more expertise, but but even in terms of philosophers, I mean, basically we're talking about value judgments, and everybody's value judgment is is, is I think as valuable as as anybody else's, as long as they've they've really thought through the issues. One final thing about about intergenerational equity. Intergenerational equity. It's very common to want to model intergenerational equity as caring about, let's say, consumption in period one, which is our generation, and utility in period two. Or we could say, we could say utility in period one. Either one, either utility in period one or consumption in period one, but what I want to concentrate on is 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 utility in period two. There's another idea which says do the same thing in period one, but in period two just look at consumption in period two. And here's the difference between these. Let's suppose that our utility function, which more or less measures how happy we are for a certain level of consumption. It looks like this. So this is us, this is generation one. And we want to be altruistic to the next generation, which is generation two. And our first idea is to say we care about how happy they are. So we care about we care about their utility. But what if generation two have very much more demanding tastes than we do? Suppose that for the for for this small level of consumption, let's say a consumption of two, we get this much utility from it, but gener but generation two only gets this much utility from it. You could another way to express it is they could be spoiled brats and they just don't get as much happiness as we do from the same level of utility. Well, if you wanted to make, if this is generation one's utility, and you wanted to give the same utility to generation two, giving generation two the same utility as generation one would give them way more consumption than generation one. If generation one is consuming two, this would it would require, you know, it might require, I don't know, five or six units of consumption to give generation two the same utility as generation one, because generation two just doesn't appreciate consumption as much. So which is fair? Is it, f is, does, does being fair really mean we get two and they get five? Uh, if you answer no, then you really want to think about intergenerational equity in the second kind of way. And we care about our utility and their consumption. So if, if we have this level of utility from consuming two, then we would define intergenerational equity in, this, in the second way as saying they should also get a chance to consume two. So they should be, get a chance to consume as much as, as we do, how much they enjoy it, that's really, we don't really care how much they enjoy it. What we care about is that, that whatever we can consume, they can consume. And if that makes them a lot more unhappy than we are, well, that's tough luck for them. So that's the distinction between two different, two different ideas of intergenerational equity. Um, two quick final comments. In terms of intergenerational equity, what do we wish our grandparents had done? So many environmentalists make the argument that we should use a low rate of discount because future generations are going to be worse off because they're going to be in a world that's more polluted, that has a higher global mean temperature, that has less resources. And so we should make sacrifices now in order to make them better off. Historically, it, 
would this argument have held? If you translate this argument back a hundred years, then what what those people would be saying was that people a hundred years ago should have really sacrificed for the benefit of people living today. But actually, living standards today are way higher than they were a hundred years ago. Actually, if we wanted to be fair between generations, the generation that had it worse off was the people a hundred years ago, not us. And so historically, what intergenerational equity would have demanded is to make current genera earlier generations, you, you, we want to use a high discount rate to, to, to help uh, earlier generations rather than later generations. Because it was the earlier generations that were poor and the later generations that are richer. So there's some people that look back in history and say, well, history shows that earlier generations are poor, future generations are richer. We now are the earlier generations compared to our descendants. We're, therefore, if the historical pattern holds, going to be the poorer ones. And so we should be worried about taking money from our grandchildren. We shouldn't be worried about giving money to our grandchildren. The response is, history doesn't foretell the future. Just because in the past it's been true that earlier generations were better off than later generations, that doesn't mean that that's going to be true here in the 21st century. Because we're facing problems like resource extraction, resource exhaustion, environmental pollution, that are getting worse and worse and worse. So, so the counter argument is don't use history. Just assume mindlessly that history is going to repeat and say, therefore, the problem is that our grandchildren are going to be filthy rich, and we're really poor, and we should be trying to get money from our grandchildren. Maybe history is not going to repeat. Maybe this time it really is different. And, and therefore, our grandchildren are actually probably going to be a lot poorer than we are. And that therefore, the intergenerational, que intergenerational equity question is a question of helping them out, not a question of helping us out. And the other final thing, um, I, I said up here that the interest rate is positive. But if you look at the Wall Street Journal on interest rates for German government bonds, Swiss government bonds, you see negative numbers. If you look at the so-called real interest rate, the interest rate minus inflation for U.S. Treasury inflation Treasury inflation protected securities, which are bonds, you see negative real interest rates right now in the Wall Street Journal. So what what about that? Um yes, there are negative interest rates nowadays. I don't think we want to use negative interest rates in dynamic problems, though. And let me explain why using an example of a cake eating problem. And I know this video is going to be really long, but this is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise. So you got a question. You have a cake. And the cake is made up of hardtack or something that lasts forever. And the question is, when should you eat the cake? And suppose you have a negative discount rate. Now, a positive discount rate means impatience, means you want to eat the cake now rather than later. A negative discount rate means the opposite of that. So it's always better to eat the cake tomorrow rather than today. So let's make a graph of how much utility you get from eating the cake at a different time. If you eat the cake today at time zero, you don't get much utility. If you eat it tomorrow at time one, this is time one, you get more utility. If you eat it the day after tomorrow, or the year after tomorrow, a year after this, uh, let's say year two, you get a little more utility. If you eat it in year three, you would get a little more utility. When should you eat the cake? Well, if the discount rate's always negative, then the, f the farther into the future you postpone the date at which you eat the cake, the more utility you get. What is the utility maximizing answer? Hmm. Well, the utility maximizing answer is actually to set t equals infinity. 
But if you set t equals infinity, what that actually means is you never eat the cake. And if you never eat the cake, the utility you actually get is zero, which is worse, which is the worst possible utility. It's worse than any of these numbers. So negative discount rates generate this paradox that you always want to postpone consumption. But postponing consumption as much as you can generates the worst possible outcome of never consuming anything at all. So negative discount rates generate this paradox in intertemporal planning. And that means that even though, yes, there are negative discount rates right now in the capital markets, uh, like I said, you can see them in, in the Wall Street Journal, we and their negative discount rates out to, you know, 30-year bonds, uh, we're still going to avoid considering negative discount rates because they they, they they cause these paradoxes in planning. And because frankly, even if you have negative discount rates, um, I don't think that the right way to characterize cur the current politics around the environment is that people are too patient and too concerned about future generations. That could be a potential problem, but I don't think it's an actual problem. That people are too worried about global warming. I'm talking about people as a whole. That you know all the governments around the world are too concerned about the welfare of future generations. That doesn't seem to be the problem that we're facing. And therefore, in terms of long-run environmental problem, it doesn't seem like we're actually anybody's really using negative discount rates. They're actually using positive discount rates. They're actually taking the benefits of current living people and voters more into account than people who are going to be living and voting 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now. And so in practice, I think what governments are doing is using positive discount rates. And that's my reason for ignoring negative discount rates. Okay, finally, I'm done with this long video.